Well, good morning, Walden Church. Happy Sunday. We're so glad to have you with us. Uh, we're still on the internet, right? We're still, we're still on the internet, both here on YouTube and then over on Facebook. We go live on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. over on Facebook. And if you go over there, you'll be able to interact with maybe a couple of other people that have signed into that live moment. But we have some special news tonight. Mike Morgan and the worship team will be back at church at 6 p.m. and they'll be broadcasting live from inside the sanctuary and they'll do uh, some worship music, there'll be uh, some praise, some prayers. And so definitely come back tonight, set your clocks uh, to remind you that 6 p.m. Mike and the worship team will be back. A couple of things we want to announce to you that we're really excited about in the month of May. First of which is National Day of Prayer. National Day of Prayer is May 7th. How appropriate that the day that is set aside for the National Day of Prayer, uh, we as a nation will be returning to work, returning uh, to get back out there and continue life as normal as we make our way over this benchmark and hopefully start recovering from having been just locked away uh, for all these weeks. And so we're definitely gonna do something here at the church for National Day of Prayer. It might be something just as simple as being able to have a, a piece of paper to go through and pray for a list of things, uh, pray for the continued healing of our, our state and our country and our nation and our globe. Uh, but we're definitely gonna do something for National Day of Prayer. Keep coming back and making sure that you're uh, staying connected with us on social media and through email so that you know what we're doing. And then, May 16th and 17th, that weekend, we are saying that we're gonna be back, that we're gonna have church again, the doors will open, you will come back and worship together with us. We'll all be in the same space. And so we're looking forward to that. We're, we're, we're setting those two days aside, May 16th and 17th. We have to spread out the times so that we can allow for more people to come and so that we can also uh, make sure that we're being safe, right? We wanna make sure that we're being safe. But don't worry, we will still continue to do this. We will still broadcast the sermons both on Facebook and on YouTube. We wanna be available to you as much as possible. So if you are unable to get to church or you're still uh, cautious about uh, coming out in public, even though we will start meeting again in the sanctuary, we will still make all the sermons and lessons available to you online. We don't wanna stop doing that. We wanna keep the communication lines open as much as possible. All right, that's enough announcements. Let's get into this. I'm gonna start a new series, three parts. Uh, we're gonna talk about walking through, journeying through uh, trials, okay? And today we're gonna to just start with that as kind of an overarching uh, approach, kind of our, our prelude into the next two weeks. And so I have a passage here from John 16. Uh, this is Jesus. He says in verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says, I've got bad news and I've got good news right? He puts them both in there. The bad news first, bad news first. He says, in the world, you will have tribulation. What does that mean? Well, it means nobody lives a perfect life, right? It's true. I mean, you walk down the street, you might see someone and you might think, wow, they've got it good. Look at their car or their kids or look at their clothes or their family or their spouse. And, and and maybe you're scrolling through social media and you're on Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram and you see something highlighted with one of your friends or you're looking at their perfect life and it makes you feel like you are lacking, it makes you insecure about something. You feel like I am missing out on something. Jesus says, in the world, you will have tribulation. Guaranteed, everyone. He says, it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. Inside, people struggle. It's just a fact of life. Jesus says, in fact, it's a guarantee. He says, you will. In this life, you will, right? You will have tribulation. But then he says, there's good news. That was the bad news. Here's the good news. Because the next thing Jesus says is, but take heart, right? I have overcome the world. Nobody likes to hear they're gonna have struggles, 
They're, they're, they're going to go through trial. Jesus says, it's a guarantee. That's going to happen. I know you don't want to hear it, but it's going to happen. But in the very next breath, he says, but don't worry. It's going to happen, but don't worry. Why? Because I'm in charge of all of it. Jesus says, I hold all of it in my hand. It's kind of like saying, you know, the bad news is there's a monster under your bed, but the good news is I've already defeated it. You don't have to worry. That should make us all feel better. That should relax us. Jesus's words should reassure us. But even though we have this knowledge that God is there for us, that Christ has overcome, even that reassurance doesn't help us all the time, does it? It doesn't always relax us. It doesn't always relieve our stress because we don't like struggles. We don't like pain. We don't like going through those things. We don't like conflict. But if you look back on your own life, look at how things have gone, and you consider all the things that have shaped you and maybe grown you, forced you to grow up, those things that have molded you and crafted you into the person that you are, I would argue, I would bet that many of those important things were struggles, that they were trials. I mean, what helps you spiritually grow the most? What, what do you think has changed your life the most or changed you into the person you are the most? It was probably a time of difficulty. But when the struggle comes, we don't look anxiously toward it, right? We're not excited for it. We're not standing on the edge of our seat waiting for it. And we're thinking, oh, goody, here's another opportunity for me to grow, right? We don't, we don't seek out pain. We don't wish it upon ourselves. And as a pastor, I know I'll, I'll, I want to help you grow. I want to help people grow. I would love for you to grow more deeper in your walk, more spiritually mature, more closer to Jesus, more dependent upon God. And I might throw out all of these very easy suggestions. Pray more, read your Bible, spend time alone with God, tithe, get into a small group, uh, study your Bible, memorize your Bible, get into a mentoring relationship or a discipling relationship. And all of those things are great, they are. But they're all, they're all a process and they're all slow. None of those are a quick fix to spiritual maturity. They take time. So maybe if you you grow, right? We know we grow in difficult situations. We know we grow in trials. Then how do we make a program for that? Right? The church should have a program for that. We should, we should make you go through a trial, make you go through a tribulation so that you'll grow. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Right? How, do, how do we as a church encourage you to run towards trials instead of running away from them? That's, that's really God's area, right? Those, those are God's programs, not ours. But, I mean, that, that is life. I mean, when God is ready to move in your life, God is ready to teach you something, God is ready to change you or grow you, He will put your life, <laughs> this is what it feels like, right? He'll put your life into a giant pressure cooker. And we know they're coming. We all know they're coming. Jesus says it's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. But we also know that God will use those opportunities as teachable moments. He will use those opportunities to help grow us and shape us, to draw us closer to him, to mature us. So the, I guess the big question then is, if we know they're coming, how do we prepare for them? How do we get ready? How do we go through the trial with the understanding that I'm going to take more from it than it will take from me? Because that would be the healthy way to approach a trial. That would be the healthy way to approach an obstacle or suffering, right? To take more from it than it takes from me. I mean, in for us right now with the pandemic and COVID-19, I think COVID-19 has taken from us. 
right? And it's taken from all of us. It's taken time from our, our school, our job. It's taken our money. It's taken our economy. It's taken away our friends. And that's, those are some of the, those are some of the easy things to endure. Others of us, COVID-19 has taken so much more from them. COVID-19 has also taken away uh, stability. It has taken away confidence. COVID-19 has ramped up child abuse, ramped up spousal abuse, ramped up depression, ramped up alcoholism. We as a nation need to begin to learn how to process these trials, to navigate these trials in a healthy way because, because nobody escapes them, right? Nobody escapes them. We, we're all going to experience the peaks and the valleys of life. We all have high points and low points in life. So what do we do? What do we do? One of the TV shows that uh, Joanna and I watch that we enjoy watching is a show called uh, Running Wild with Bear Grylls. Now, Bear Grylls, if you don't know, uh, he used to have another show called Man vs. Wild, where he would put himself in survival situations and then show you how to get out of them. Now, in, in Running Wild, he, he grabs celebrities and removes them from the Hollywood world and plops them down in the middle of nowhere. And then over a, a weekend, he has them uh, doing survival instincts, uh, rappelling down the sides of mountains, going through glaciers, jumping into ice cold water, sleeping out under the stars, and occasionally eating a bug or two. And Brie Larson has been on the show, Dave Bautista, Channing Tatum, Zachary Quinto, Shaquille O'Neal, Ben Stiller, Kate Winslet, Kate Hudson, Nick Jonas, even Barack Obama has been on the show. And one of the things that happens on the show quite frequently, and I always, I, I always get a kick out of this because it happens a lot. Every time he has somebody rappel down the side of a mountain or rappel down the side of a rock cliff or a rock facing, the same thing always happens. People who've never done it before are very hesitant to lean back because the right way to repel is to lean far back so that your body is almost horizontal with the earth, right? And you're allowing gravity and the rope to lower you. But that doesn't feel natural for us. It doesn't feel natural to lean back and to trust. It feels more natural for us to stand upright and to support myself by myself, to use my legs, to use my girth, right? And, and where I square myself on the earth, that feels more natural. So these people, they fight against literally the planet, right? And they're trying to right themselves. And all that does is it twists and turns them and confuses them. And they're frustrated because they can't get down this trial. And what they need to do is not lean away from it, they need to lean into it, right? They need to lean into it and they need to trust. They need to trust in the things that are there to help them. They need to trust in the things that are there to protect them. James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James says, trials are coming, right? Just like Jesus, they're guaranteed. Trials are coming. So count it all as joy. What is wrong with James? Because <laughs> nobody does that, right? You read this passage and you think to yourself, nobody does that. James is crazy right? My trials are not joy. But he doesn't say consider your trials joy. Does he? Because that's not true. Trials are not fun. Nobody likes trials. But when handed a trial, James says, look at this as something that is going to get you there. 
Look at this as something that is going to bring you great value. Look at this as something that you are going to get more out of it than it takes from you. Here is something that will give you something. This is going to bring you something. He says, count it as joy because the trial is going to produce something in you. And he says, that thing is actually going to complete you. That's what he says, right? He says, you will be lacking in nothing. That means complete. James says, trials make us complete. I mean, isn't that why we do anything in life? Isn't that why you do anything in life to complete yourself? That's why you pursue anything. That's why you accomplish anything, want, desire, anything to complete yourself, to make you feel like you lack nothing. We want to lack nothing. So we pursue all those things. We pursue money and power and, and status and family and marriage. And we hope that those things will complete us. I want to be complete. James says, the bad news is you need to learn that those trials are there so that you can learn to trust and lean back on God. And with his help, you will grow and you will find that you lack nothing. But that's hard for us to do. It's not natural for us to do. Because when a trial comes into our life, our natural response is to run the other direction. Our natural response is to turn and flee. And then when we do that, then we feel bad. We run away and we feel bad. And we think to, my, to ourselves, I'm, I'm weak. Ah, there I go again. And you beat yourself up and you say, I'm a, I'm a weak person. It's not bad to have a reminder that you're weak, especially when we have a God that wants to be our strength. So what I need to do is I need to lean back and I need to trust. I need to lean into it. I need to turn into it and trust. I need God's support because I am weak. I need God's strength because I am weak. Those trials, those are my daily reminders that I need to trust in God and that he completes me. You see, I think the point to life, we've, we've got it backwards. We've got it so, so wrong. We think the point of life is to maximize comfort and to minimize pain. See, because when I maximize comfort, I feel great. So that obviously means life is good. When pain is maximized, well, I feel bad. And then I think, well, I guess life isn't so great. But that's not the point of life. Hebrews 13, 14 says, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. What is the author of Hebrews saying? What, is the, what do they mean? The author of Hebrews says, This planet is not your home. Right? For we here have no lasting city. Texas is not your home. The United States is not your home. This planet is not your home. Heaven is your home. And that needs to be our mindset. The things that we do, the things that we pursue here on earth are not to build an earthly kingdom. The things we do here, the reason why we are here is to build a heavenly one. So just a few quick thoughts about going through our trials. And let's just remind ourselves really quickly what James said. James says, count it all as joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the first thing James wants you to know is that trials produce joy, right? He doesn't say trials are joy, right? Because we know they're not. Trials produce joy. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19 says, 
Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, what is Habakkuk talking about? What is he saying? What's he talking about right now? He's talking about the economy, right? He's talking about the economy. He's saying that the farms are barren. There's no product in the stores. And he says, even though, even though the stores are empty, what does he say? Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, he says in verse 19, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer and he makes me tread in my high places. He says he gives me that footing I need on the rock face, right? Even though I'm scared, I lean back and I know that God's got me. See, for the Christian, joy is not the byproduct of my circumstance. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. Joy comes from my connectedness with God. Listen, there is a very real and actual joy in the heart and the life of the person that is even going through the most intense pain and the most enduring trial because the Spirit is producing it. Joy is listed as one of the fruits of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. 2 Corinthians 7 says, I am filled with comfort in all our affliction. I am overflowing with joy. Next, James says, trials produce steadfastness, or we would say trials produce uh, perseverance or patience, right? It means unwavering. It means firm. It means that you are not moving, that you are rock solid, firmly planted feet on the ground, right? Joanna and I have been using this time of lockdown to teach patience to our two sons, and uh, they love it. No, <laughs> because the boys know that there is no schedule. They know there's no schedule. They know there's nothing holding us to any time of day, right? But we are trying to make certain things happen at certain times. And we decided that we're going to wait for those times to arrive. If it's worth having, if it's worth owning, if it's worth doing, then it's worth waiting for. Sometimes, just like now, the trial is just in the waiting. There isn't physical pain. There isn't any you know, serious anguish. There is just the unending passing of time. 1 Peter 1 says, In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Has the takeaway this month been for you a lesson of patience? Have you been trying to be still? Have you been trying to be calm? To listen? To not fill your days with busyness? Have you used this as an opportunity to learn patience, to sit still and to wait? Or did you just look at this as just another day, another week, right? It's, yes, lockdown, so what? I'm going to stay busy. I'm going to take on more projects than ever before. I'm going to continue to go out and see my friends and do the things I've always done. In fact, I'm going to take on more work to do because now I have the time. Paul says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Notice that Paul groups those things together. Paul groups together endurance and patience with joy. 
He puts those things together. That, that is not the theme of the world that we live in, is it? In fact, if it's slow for us, we'd say that's bad, right? Slow equals bad in 2020. You have a slow car, that's bad. You have to, you, slow loan approval, bad. I'm, I've been waiting all day for this email. I've been waiting all day for this text. Why is dinner taking so long? How come our internet is so slow? If it's slow, it's bad. That's what the world teaches you. My advice is don't buy into that. Don't live that way. You might see the slowness as a trial. You might see the slowness as being unbearable, but God might be trying to teach you patience. Why would he do that? Because patience leads to joy? right? Patience leads to joy. Patience leads to contentment. Patience leads to completeness. James says, and let steadfastness have its full effect. Have its full effect in your life. That means don't miss it. Sit in it. Wait in it. Why? That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the third thing is trials produce maturity. Trials produce maturity. According to James, this is the ultimate purpose of all trials, to lead us to maturity. He calls it not lacking in anything. One day, uh, as the disciples were on their way, uh, they saw a blind man. The Bible says he was blind from birth. And they became very curious as to why this man had to endure this long trial. And so they asked Jesus a question. They said, did this man sin? And this is the reason why he suffers? Or does he suffer for someone else? Like did his parents sin and now he has to suffer for it? Jesus says in John 9, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the work of God should be revealed in him. Jesus confirms the trials that are present in our life, they are not necessarily good or bad. Sometimes something will happen to us and we'll say under our breath, well, this is typical. This always happens to me. Why does this all, ugh, I, am, <clears throat> I am so stupid, right? I'm an idiot. I wasn't paying attention. But Jesus confirms for us that our mistakes are not always the reason why we suffer. In fact, with the blind man, this person who had suffered his entire life, the reason for it was so that God could be displayed, so that God's power could be shown. Have you ever stopped and wondered where you were on the path to spiritual maturity? Where are you on that road? Do you see your next goal? Is there something that you're working towards? Is there a signpost along the way that's guiding you as you go? Are there mile markers that say, this is how far I've come. Look, look, look how far I've come. There are too many people who settle in this life and they don't have those goals marked out ahead of them. And they are content to drift and they are content to settle. Don't be one of those people. Let's not continue to run away from our trials. Rather, let's learn to lean back on God and to trust that he has something that he wants to complete in us. I know James says, count it all as joy. But do you know what? Even Jesus didn't love trials. Jesus didn't love his time in the desert. He also wasn't singing and dancing in the garden before his arrest. In fact, the author of Hebrews says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what? Endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Did you catch that? Because that's exactly what we've been saying, right? 
Where was the joy for Jesus? The author of Hebrews says it was out ahead of him. And what did he have to do to get there? He had to endure. He had to endure the cross. Jesus didn't love trials. The Bible says in the garden, he prayed. He prayed that the trial would be taken away from him. But he said, God, if you'd rather redeem it than remove it, then do that. And that's what God did. God redeemed that trial. God redeemed that suffering that Jesus patiently endured. How's your job? How's your career? How are the kids? How's your spouse? How are uh, paying bills going? How are your fears? How are your insecurities? It's time to lean back into God's care. It's time to lean back and trust that God has you right where he needs you to be. I know that's not our impulse. Our impulse is to try to stand on our own two feet, but we need to lean back in God's care. Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Yes, I know you are a dependent creature. You want to do it on your own. You think that you know how best to live your life. You think you know best how to lower yourself down the rock face. But the God who is in control of your life and the God who is in control of everything, the God who loves you, wants you to approach the trial with him. And he wants to support you. He wants to carry you. He wants to be your anchor all the way down. These things in life, they are there to grow us, to shape us, to mature us. And as James says, to complete us. Listen, there is no job that can do that for you. There is no life pursuit that can complete you. There is no person, there's no spouse, there's no dream spouse, no dream kids, no dream bank account, no dream car that can complete you. When you face those trials, and Jesus says they're guaranteed, right? They're guaranteed. Let's stop running away from them. Let's stop running away. Instead, let's run towards the God who says, but don't worry, I've already overcome them. I've already defeated them. And when you're here with me, when you learn to trust me, then you'll be able to say with confidence, God, I have everything. I lack nothing because I have you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, right now it feels like maybe, hopefully, we're nearing the end of a very long trial. And many of us are losing the battle of boredom, of strength, of will. Lord, even now, whether this is the end or the middle or the beginning or whatever, we don't ever want to face life without you. We don't ever want to face trials without you. We need you to be our anchor, to be our support, to be our guide all the way. We want to grow more closer to you, more spiritually mature. We want to grow stronger and more dependent on you with each passing day. Lord, help us to tune out the things that the world teaches us and to lean in to hear you, to know you, to draw closer to you, and to want to be more like you and the, your son who you set to be our example. We thank you so much for this time of worship, this time of prayer and preparation. We look forward to our worship tonight, and we just ask that you continue to grow with this church. Help us to be more like your son and help us to minister and to give and to care for this world that you've given us. We offer it all in your son's precious name. 
Amen. Hey, thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Thanks for having some time of prayer and preparation. Uh, and don't forget to come back tonight at six o'clock to be with the worship team. And uh, you can always share this file too. This is a YouTube file with a link. You can just share this to your Facebook wall and uh, share it to Twitter or share it uh, so that other people can see it, your friends and family. And it can be a great way to minister to their lives, share some hope and inspiration with them, and also do some evangelism and tell people about the church that you love. I love you guys. We'll see each other soon. Bye.